All right, Uncle Fester, what do you have against Halloween? You titled this video, The Satanic Origins of Halloween Exposed. The Dan Bedon, the Dan Bedon, the Dan Bedon, the Dan Bedon. You titled this video, The Satanic Origins of Halloween Exposed. Aren't you being just a tad bit over the top here? And who in their right mind would argue that Halloween has satanic origins? There is only one person I can think of who is this dumb. And uh, speaking of the Illuminati and such, we got our guest. Um, no. Former Illuminati. No, it can't be. Former satanic high priest. No. <laughs> Mr. William Snow. No. Just like the Bible says, it's basically an intergalactic invasion into this space through people. I, I'm telling you, it's what all the ancients said, it's what they warned of, it's what we're dealing with. They're demons. And the satanic cult and coven that's in this, hidden in this Christian church, lives like a Christian. Okay, not every one of them, because I wasn't, and I know of some, a couple other who weren't. Repent but now, repent now. A secretary of state that has had sex in giant vats of feces. They have sexual rituals, some of the most ancient Egyptian rituals, where they believe they are possessed by entities, basically space aliens. The minions of the evil one can travel through telephone lines, they can travel through cable TV, they can travel through the internet into your computer. Repent now, repent now. I used to worship this guy, okay? And, um, I don't know if you can see it well on my camera, but you can uh, have a look at this one here, okay? 911, what's your emergency? There are demon worshippers in a cult staff. Are you in immediate danger? I think so. Okay, what is the threat? There's a man pulling dead clothes out of his hat. How is that a threat? The kids are singing devil songs, whacking a horse effigy, oh, or they're eating what came out of his head. Ma'am, do you see any party streamers? Yeah. Do you see a cake? You mean a pagan pastry? I do. That is a child's birthday party. Ma'am? I'd like to report a hate crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming back. We had Mr. Sobel on several times over the years, and um, what a great man. Yeah, that is one big pile of shit. And, um, he um, really, really exposes the the dark trenches from the abyss and uh thank you for joining us again well it's really easy to expose all the straw men when you create them yeah sure it's wonderful okay so we got a break coming up so you want to give a quick introduction yourself then when we get back from the break we can roll right into this whole Sawin halloween origins just because you mispronounce the name of a Gaelic word to force it to sound like the Americanized hyphenated word of Halloween, which means the all holy evening, does not make these holidays the same. Well, yeah, um, it's uh, basically, um, yeah, I was involved in witchcraft for many years, 16 years or more, and... Um, oh, good. This should be entertaining. <laughs> Billy Boy tells such creative and imaginary stories. This man claims to have been a witch, a druid, an occultist, a Mormon, a voodoo priest, Freemason, and an Illuminati member, vampire, a Catholic, and now he claims to be a born-again Christian? Oh, I am sure Mr. BS is completely dedicated to his present path. And trying to get the word out about the dangers of these pagan holidays. And, you know, many other things as well. We're trying to draw people into repentance and, you know, following him instead of following the dark side. So, that's it. We, of course, have a website with one accord. We have a YouTube Don't channel. Don't look at the camera. Don't look at it. Uh, we have all kinds of free resources. <laughs> I, I doubt either one of them can hear each other yet. <laughs> Amazing. So, all right. So, if you want to hang tight right there, we're gonna to go to a break. And, um, folks, uh, hold on to your seats. And we got this is, um, you know, a couple of weeks going into Halloween, and you need to know the dark side of it because when you learn and find out what it's really about, it's gonna make you think twice about going out with your kids. And we'll be right back on the Dan Bedondi show. Oh, yeah. Halloween has come down to us as a secular holiday, having loose origins in both Christian and pre Christian folk traditions. But, yeah. It's evil and demonic, and if you celebrate it, you are basically Satan.
Oh, okay. Yeah. And we are back on the Dan Bedani Show, your October 16th, 2018 edition of the Dan Bedani Show, right here at 990wbob.com. Check me out, truthradioshow.com. And we got our guest, William Schnoblin, who's a former Satanic High Priest and a former Illuminati member, uh, Mr. Schnoblin. Um, so um, we left, you started with the introduction. So if you want to uh, jump right into, because unfortunately it's a short show here, you know what I mean? So if you want to jump into. Um, Basically, the whole history and origins of Halloween as we know as Samhain. Why are you asking him? <laughs> he won't give a truthful answer. Even if he knew the truth, he would not give you a straight answer. His goal is to disparage and demonize witches, occultists, and Satanists. And, well, <laughs> pretty much everyone, really. Yeah, well, you know, the thing people don't understand is they look at it as this kind of fun holiday for the kids and all of that candy and, and whatnot, but, you know, if you go back, you know, like a couple thousand years, you will find out that this is a very dark, satanic, pagan holiday. If you go back a few thousand years, Halloween was moved to October 31st from May 31st around 1000 CE. And I am sure how Christians celebrate the Feast of All Saints has greatly changed since then. Uh, because... You know, many people, even in the church, don't understand that witchcraft is real. It's a real thing. It's not just something that was made up by Walt Disney or the Brothers Grimm or something. I mean, for thousands of years, there have been witches. There are witches actually in the Bible. I mean, it talks about the Witch of Endor in the Book of Samuel, you know, First Samuel. So, to begin with, we have this fraudulent premise because people assume, okay, there's no such thing as ghosts, there's no such thing as vampires or any of this stuff. No such thing as witches. And so this is just this fun fantasy thing that kids can No such thing as witches. Fairy tale witches that Disney portrays in biblical witch characters did not exist. However, modern day witches do exist. Although they are more likely to recreate full customs of honoring the dead around this time, than they are of flying on a broomstick or wiggling their nose to make objects levitate. Fictional witches, vampires, and ghosts do not exist. Wait, didn't you claim to have been a vampire that lived off of nothing but human blood for 18 months? I chose to become a vampire because it seemed, you know, sexier somehow. <laughs> and uh, so uh, anyhow, I went through about a year and a half where basically I lived on nothing but human blood. I thought so. I do, but nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. It's a it's a real satanic holiday. It goes back thousands of years to ancient, you know, pagan Britain in Northern Europe, where, as you mentioned, it was called Sowie. That, that was its ancient name in, in uh, you know, the Celtic language back then. And it, Yes, <laughs> Samhain goes back to Ireland as it means the end of summer, and it was most likely widely celebrated in pre-Christian times. Witches and modern-day pagans and other such folk reconstruct what our ancestors may have practiced based off archaeological research, historical evidence, folklore, and through folk customs. As to what exactly the pre-Christian peoples of Europe and the British Isles practice at this time, we have some evidence, but most of it was lost, wiped out, and then replaced. It, it, see, it was the time that, you know, because they had this cycle, they, you know, the devil, <clears throat> pardon me, he, uh, he counterfeits. The devil. You mean the modern Christian personification of sin and evil? That fictional character? He copycats the feasts of the Almighty, the feasts of Yahweh that are in the Bible. You know, like the feast of Passover, the feast of Pentecost, and so on. They go around the seasons of the year. All those Hebrew holidays originated thousands of years before Halloween and thousands of miles away from the British Isles. Halloween has little to do with pre-Christian celebrations around the end of summer and absolutely nothing in common with Hebrew holidays. Like we just, a few uh, week or two ago, we went to the Feast of Tabernacles. It's, it's a biblical feast. Well, what he did, the devil rather, is he came up with these counterfeit feasts. And this is like the, the, the people were deceived thousands of years ago into believing, okay, the sun god is God. You know, the sun up in the sky. Is 
And which Bible are you getting this information from? Where does it say anything about the devil coming up with counter feasts? Pre-Christian cultures and religions already had developed celebrations based off of harvest times. That is why many folk traditions involve specific times of seasonal change. As we went into the colder times of the years, our ancestors had various feasting holidays. The devil did not invent Samhain. Humankind invented it. It most likely had evolved into a very meaningful and joyous time. Records showing it was a three-day festival starting around October 31st and continuing on until November the 2nd. He is a, is, a, is a god, and the earth is a goddess, and, you know, the moon is, a, is somehow also a goddess, and, you know, so anyway, what they came up with was the idea, okay, in the northern hemisphere, the sun appears to be getting weaker now. The days are getting shorter. It appears that the sun is moving further and further away, and ultimately, it appears to quote unquote die around the time of Yule, which is December 22nd, 23rd, the winter solstice. And so, what they came up with is this idea that on, on Halloween, on Halloween night, October 31st, that, that the sun god would start dying. Really? Where exactly are you getting that? Who are they? And then he would be reborn on Yule. And it, because that's when the sun starts getting stronger again, the, the days start getting longer, etc. So, but you see, unlike the true and living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that's in the Bible, these false gods, they need blood. So these false gods that are dying around this time need blood? So if these gods get enough blood, do they not die? We could have an eternal summer? Or do you think our pre-Christian ancestors looked at the turning of the seasons and the shorter nights as cyclical events? They need terror. They need, they need human lives to give them power kind of like recharging their batteries. So Our ancestors were well aware that seasons come and they go. They observed the stars and constellations and even the planets to predict times of harvest, feasting, and even celebration. There is no evidence to suggest that our pre-Christian ancestors needed human lives to recharge the batteries. And so, in ancient times, it was believed that it was necessary to have human sacrifices uh, especially of children or virgins or something like that, innocent blood, you know, quote unquote, to empower the, uh, the sun god as he was going into this dark season so that by the time he got to Yule, he could be reborn. The archaeological and anthropological evidence we have today regarding bodies recovered in bogs may point to possible rare human sacrifices where the victim was strangled, stabbed, and thrown into water to drown. However, the bodies discovered seem to have been of adults who were well fed and well manicured, leading some scholars to speculate that they were nobility or possibly high ranking members of society. Whether they were sacrifices, criminals, or high-ranking prisoners of war is still up for debate. So this whole idea of trick-or-treat okay, is rooted in the idea that in, in ancient times, in Northern Europe, where, you know, England and Northern Europe, that's where the nights get really pretty short. You know, like one... He meanders off topic for a while, so I'm going to skip ahead a little. Direction. He's still rambling on about whatever. Because of that, they really feared this, and they would send out their pagan priests, and they would go door to door. They would demand a sacrifice, either you know an animal or even your firstborn child. If you want to um, hold it right there, because they're going to break coming up in about thirty seconds. Um, so uh, if you want to uh, st stick right there, uh, but when we get sure. back, we're gonna he's gonna finish that, and also if you want to know where the bonfire came from, bobbing for apples, folks. This is whole rituals have been going on for thousands of years, but we'll be right back on the Dan Bedondi show with our guest William Schnoblin. But we left off um, how uh, Mr. William Schnoblin here was talking about how they took the children uh, to sacrifice them. You know, basically took their innocence by taking a uh, virginity away, then slayed them before. Uh, Bao, B-A-A-L, and uh, so uh, Mr. Schnoblin, uh, if you want to continue. 
I mean, it's just bullshit. Fuck. Um, yeah. Mr. Bullshit here doesn't know his beard from toilet paper. There is no evidence that I am aware of that has led any scholars to believe that the druids sacrificed their children, and there is definitely no evidence supporting that they even knew of Baal, which was a title like lord, chief, or leader, and predates the druids by several thousand years, not to mention about 29,000 miles due east of Gaul. Yeah, and I guess what I was going with that is this is not just an historical thing. This is going on today. No, Billy. It is not going on today. And, you know, we always... That, you know, if you have children, keep a close eye on them during this season. Because I don't care if they're adolescents or if they're children or even if they're toddlers, you know, uh, keep an eye on them. Because, you know, like, for example, a lot of people don't know this, but just a couple of years, the last year we have solid statistics on was 2015, and over 440,000 children went missing from America. No, not sure where you got those numbers, but they are way off. The total of stranger abducted children under the age of 21 was around 325 in 2015 and less than 300 in 2016. According to the Polyclass Foundation in 2016, there was a total of 298 missing person cases. Of those cases, 215 were located safely, one was found deceased, 267 was located and closed, and 37 are still actively being searched for. 99.8% of the children who go missing do come home. Nearly 90% of missing children have simply misunderstood directions or miscommunicated their plans, are lost, or have run away. 9% are kidnapped by family members in custody disputes. 3% are abducted by non-family members, usually during the commission of a crime such as a robbery or a sexual assault. The kidnapper is often someone the child knows. Only about 100 children are kidnapped each year in the stereotypical strange abductions you hear about in the news. About half of these 100 children come home. United States of America, over 400,000 went missing. And of them, now of course a lot of them were like issues of a kid wandering off and they found him and all of that, or, or like with divorced parents, maybe one parent took the other 12 parent, you know, that kind of child, you know. But 42,000 of those children were, went missing in 2015, never returned. They're just lost. Whoa. And, and I always, that, that's huge. I mean, that's almost the size of the city that I live in. Then you live in a very small city, Billy Boy, containing only 325 people. Missing children of all ages, you know, from toddlers all the way up to, you know, the age of, I would imagine, 18 or 20. So, you know, and many of those kids are taken by these groups and, you know, locked up and tortured and because you see there there's a belief in these satanic groups that you get life out of the blood but if you uh, if you like frighten and terrify the individual especially a child because it's much easier to frighten a child than an adult um, and if you scare them and frighten them and get the adrenaline going in their blood and they're just full of abject terror and if you torture them or whatever then when you finally kill them the life force that's released is so much more powerful to feed themselves and their dark god. I don't even know where you got this stupid idea. Somehow you believe that this secret satanic cult believes that sacrificing children gives them power? Where are you getting this from? Of course, the same question still stands unanswered. But what evidence do you have for this? So this is a horrible thing. But yeah. this is especially a child. And, you know, we understand now that, that this has been going on for thousands of years and it just started to come out of there. These, these pedophile rings, these people that, that you know, steal children, that, that kidnap, you know, and even adolescents and take them and sexually molest them and then murder them. And they devour them. Some of these people are cannibals. And, the, you know, because. I don't know if you know this, but the origin of the word cannibal 
is a corruption of the word Kohen Baal, which means priest of Baal. Oh, well. No. Where the hell did you get this nonsense? The word cannibal means human that eats human flesh. It is from 1550s from Spanish, from cannibal or carabal, a savage cannibal, from cannibal. Christopher Columbus's rendition of the Caribis name for themselves, often given in modern transliterations as Kalina or Karina, see Carib or com compare Caliban. The natives were believed by the Europeans to be anthropophagites. Anthropoph... Wow. Anthrop... I am learning a lot of new words today. Columbus, seeking evidence that he was in Asia, thought the name meant the natives were subjects of the Great Khan. The form was reinforced by later writers who connected it to Latin canis, dog, in reference to the supposed veracity, a coincidence which naturally tickled the etymological fancy of the 16th century. The Spanish word had reached French by 1515. So, you know, they, they just like, you know, in, in some churches, you know, they will have communion, and they believe they're symbolically, you know, consuming the, the body and blood of Christ. Well, in the satanic churches, they, um, they will consume literally the body and blood of children, or, or, or of a virgin, or whatever, you know, and they believe this is a satanic sacrament. Really? What satanic group? Where are they? Who are they? What evidence do you have of this happening? I always say this, and I'm going to keep saying it until you actually fucking do it. If you have any evidence of kidnap, restraining, torturing, abusing, raping, or murder of any human being, adult or otherwise, report it to the proper authorities immediately. And um, you're speaking also about um, these little traditions of Halloween and all that. Um, do you want to explain, like, the basically, because we know everybody today, they go to parties and they have a bucket full of water and everybody goes bobbing for apples and they have the bonfire thing. And uh, if you want to quickly run over those two traditions that um actually rituals? Yeah, well, you know, of course, what would happen is, see, all of these sun god type deities, okay, they're fire gods. You know, because the, the sun, you know, is obviously a fiery thing up there. And they would, you know, they would believe that if they, as the sun grows darker, they would do what they call, they would light bale fires, was the word they would use. Today we call them bonfires. And they would create these big, enormous fires on the hilltops. This is in, you know, like ancient Britain or Ireland. And they would, they would dance around them and try to, you know, invoke the power of the fire gods to keep the, uh, the sun from dying. Because they literally thought the sun was dying. And, of course, they would also, depending on the, the community and what their, their traditions were, they would actually throw infants into the fire. No, bonfires were ways of marking the start of a celebration. For example, the story of St. Patrick and the Hill of Tara, where Patrick lit the bonfire, marking the beginning of the spring equinox. In 433 CE, according to legend, the High King Loer forbade the lighting of any fires on a given night approaching the festival of Ostara. When the great bonfire would be lit on the hill of Tara, this sabbat corresponded to the Christian observance of Easter, and so Patrick lit his own fire on the hill of Slain, across from Tara, which burned so brightly that the king saw it and sent his soldiers to arrest whoever had defied him, and to douse the flame. There is no record or evidence that supports this ridiculous assertion that pre-Christian Irish threw children into bonfires at Samhain. Mortality rates for children back then were very high. Adopting a child sacrifice cult would be self-imposed genocide. Again, Billy Goat, this is absolute grade A bullshit. Which sounds just absolutely horrible, of course. You know, throw a live baby into this huge fire. But it was, you know, that's what the Bible's talking about. It says to pass your children through the fires of Moloch, because Moloch is another name for Baal, and he was worshipped by infant sacrifice. So, you know. There was a belief around May Day, or Beltane, where couples would pass through the fire. Livestock would be herded so as to pass between two bonfires. This symbolically burned away the bad luck from the passing 
dark season and was for good luck. Modern day witches jump over bonfires for good luck today. Modern day witches and those who celebrate Samhain today are not throwing babies into a fire. You are so fucking stupid. Anyway, that's the story behind the bale fires or the bonfire. And, you know, the, and especially to be lighting it on these high satanic holidays like Beltane, which is in the summer, or pardon me, the late spring, May 1st, or, you know, Halloween, you know, Samhain, which is October 31st. The bobbing for apples, that was originally, people were bobbing, they would, they would put, they would like to have bead, which is, you know, like a, a traditional Celtic alcohol beverage made, it's like a wine that's made from honey. And they would bob for infant skulls in this big vat of warm beef, you know, which is just absolutely disgusting, you know. But but that's what the bobbing for apples thing originally. They would bob for infant skulls and vats of mead. Mead at this time would have been highly prized. I'm not even going to address the bobbing for skulls nonsense. Not only is there no record of this, it would be nearly impossible. B.S. You once again live up to your initials. Bobbing for apples has been an autumn tradition for hundreds of years, despite its presence at Halloween parties and festivals today. However, its origins are more rooted in love and romance than tricks and treats. In fact, it began as a British courting ritual, popular among young ladies and their potential views. There were several variations of this game. In one set of rules, each apple was assigned to a potential mate. The bobber would then attempt to bite into the apple named for the young man she desired. If it only took her one try, they were destined for romance. If she succeeded with her second attempt, he would court her, but their love would fade. If it took three tries, their relationship was doomed. Another approach to the game was a race to be the first to bite an apple. The first to emerge successful would be the first to marry. A related superstition suggested that if a girl put the apple she had bitten underneath her pillow, she would see her future soulmate in her dreams that night. Eventually, the game declined in popularity, and by the 1800s it was common only in Ireland and certain areas of England. At the end of the century, though, Americans exploring their immigrant roots decided to bring back this Celtic fall tradition as a game for both children and adults at Halloween parties. So anyhow, I went through about a year or a half where basically I lived on nothing but human blood and Catholic community.